Welcome to Slaughterhouse Stories. I hope you enjoy the stories I have for you tonight. Hello to all you things that go bump in the night. Hello to all you humans as well. Welcome to the show that brings you creepypastas, short scary stories, and dark horror themed poetry from all across the world. This is the Slaughterhouse Stories Podcast, Episode 35, Happy Face. I'm your host and narrator, Ghost Train, telling you to lock your doors, get under your blanket, and keep the lights on. You can follow the show on Twitter at Iced underscore Demon or on Instagram at Slaughter underscore House underscore Stories and discuss all things spooky with me. Also, you can write in and have your email read on the show. Email SlaughterHouseStoriesPodcast at gmail.com with creepypasta requests, stories that you've written, or your own real-life paranormal encounters. Before we get to tonight's first story, I'd like to ask you a favor. If you're enjoying the show, Please head over and leave a review through iTunes and help spread the word to your friends, family, the serial killer that silently crept into your house, whomever. Tell them, be a listener, not a victim. Now, let's get spooky. Tonight we begin with a story about two would-be paranormal investigators who are out looking for proof of the things that go bump in the night. So, when one of them is given an idea by his father, they think this could finally be the chance they've been waiting for. Will these two wannabes finally see a spirit? Will they see nothing? Will they survive? Let's find out together as you listen to this title that's going to cause you to lose the game. A couple of years back, my friend Alex and I became extremely curious about the paranormal. I, of course, was a skeptic so we would often try and find abandoned locations throughout New Jersey to debunk things. Most places felt extremely normal in the day, but once it got dark, they did feel eerie. I knew it was mainly in my head, so I didn't really classify these locations as paranormal. Some notable locations I've been to were 1754 House, Etherin Asylum, and Empty Walls Mansion. These were locations we heard of and went to visit. There was this one particular location named Essex Mountain Sanatorium. This is where Alex and I had the strangest experience in our lives. But first, let's start from the beginning. It was 10.30 in the morning, eating breakfast with my dad. My phone vibrates in my pocket as I scoop down the last of my lucky charms. Alex called me on the phone about an abandoned insane asylum near where we live. I was extremely excited. I told him we should go there on Saturday and stay till 2.30 a.m. He agreed. My dad glances up and looks me straight in the eye with a creepy smile. So, duper bop, you planning on doing anything different this time so you can actually see some ghosts? He chuckles. No, do you have any ideas that could help us? I replied back. Well, there's this little game my drinking buddies used to do when we were camping. He replies with a wolfish grin on his face. He explains to me a sort of psychological experiment he used to do when he was younger. My dad only referred to it as the game. The instructions to play were very simple. 1. You must play the game between 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. 2. You must be alone during this, and you must have no one watching you, or else you won't feel the loneliness factor. 3. You must go to an area with very little sound and no windows. It must be pitch black with no lights. The last thing he told me, is that you have to have all the doors around you completely open, and they too must have no lights, sounds, or windows. Sit in the middle of the room looking at the door that is open, or both if there are two doors. I told him I would try this when we get there. He nods and looks back at his newspaper. Fast forward to Saturday, with Alex out in my front yard. He was wearing a red polo and black shorts. He sort of looks like the Asian version of Tom Cruise, but a little bit shorter. Anyways, 
He picks me up, and in about two to four hours, we arrive at the Essex Mountain Sanatorium. We arrived at night, so the place really did look creepy. We bolted to the front entrance and tried to open the front door. It was locked. We found a small window we could fit in and immediately crawled through it. Pitch black. We couldn't see anything. Alex brought out his flashlight so we could see better. The area we ended up in wasn't so bad. It was a sleeping area for patients, I think. So we didn't really freak out that much. Then, I remembered about the game my dad told me about. I opened the door to the hallway and searched for rooms that would be perfect for the game. I found a medical area room, so I went in to check it out. I told Alex to go back to the bedroom area and stay there. He was confused, so I explained to him about my game. He reluctantly agreed. I set everything up and made sure no lights were there. I opened the doors and sat in the middle of the room, staring at them. I waited. I suddenly started seeing things. After 20 minutes of starting the game, I saw shadows and heard whispers, which I realized were my own. I glanced at the dark door to the left and saw a shadow outlined near the door. My brain started giving into fear, and everything started getting worse. I started seeing my worst nightmares forming in the darkness. The grudge girl, in particular, took over most of my fears. In the corner of my eye, I saw someone's face. I knew I wasn't hallucinating. I stood up and ran like hell. I went back to the bedroom area, and I saw Alex, also frightened. We both pretty much jumped out of the small window opening. We went back to the car and started driving. We were silent for nearly two hours. I had the guts to finally speak. I asked Alex why he was so frightened. He told me, during the whole time I was in the room alone, he heard a woman screaming, coming from the room I sat in. So, I guess our wannabes are now full-fledged paranormal investigators. Good. That means you two are fair game for whatever ghosts or demons or hungry goblins find you next. Before I get started on my search, let's move into the next story of the night. This one, written by Reddit user Bad Fake Smiles, about a boy who is very annoyed with his family and how perfect they think they are. The father, the mother, the sister, so full of themselves. So egotistical. Are they really as perfect as they seem? Let's find out together. Settle in and listen as I tell the story. New Methods. I live in a family of serial killers. Psychopaths. Whatever you want to call them. They're just batshit crazy. I'm actually surprised that we still hold dinners together. Especially when the reason is to show how much we love each other. All I know is... I don't belong in this family. Hey champ, if you're not going to eat your pork roast soon, it's going to pork freeze any minute now. That's Jeremy Saxton, my dad. Typical dad, typical jokes. The whole family laughed with him, but not me. He always tries to look perfect, even when laughing. That perfect smile, that perfect hair, those perfect blue eyes. He uses them to lure strippers and prostitutes from nightclubs every other week. He brings them to the garage, where my mom pretends to catch them cheating before they both hack the girls. Oh wait, and the guys, to death. At least he's pretty fluid, I guess. Body count, 23. Oh dear, how is it that I'm so lucky that you're so handsome and funny at the same time? Most of the time you only get to keep one. Abigail Saxton, my mom, she likes to speak, dress, talk and think like she's in the 1950s. She's convinced that her only purpose in this house is to sweep, clean, and cook. She also thinks she's such a cougar, occasionally seducing the pool boys and the delivery men, then poisoning them to make them fertilizer for her tulips. This is why I stopped ordering online. Body count, 12. So, Twerp, when are you to get your first kill? That annoying, high-pitched spawn of the devil voice came from Cassie Saxton, my sister. She thinks she's all hot being crowned prom queen, influencer with 500,000 followers, and everyone's teenage girl fantasy. Well, at least according to the school's paper. She already had five different boyfriends from five different schools. That's why she thinks she's so sly. Please. Body count, five. 
I'm going to bed. I stood up. Come on, champ. You shouldn't spend too much time locked up inside your bedroom. The next thing you know, you're growing up to become a serial killer. They all burst out laughing. I went inside my room and opened up my computer. I found out that Olivia Trent posted a picture about body positivity. That's not good, I thought to myself. Good thing I coded a program where I can create multiple throwaway accounts at once, all disposable and untraceable. I wonder what I should send to her this time. Attack her weight again. Or maybe I proceed to messing with her parents' ongoing divorce. Whatever it is, it better be before she gets a therapist. It's harder with a therapist. I started typing. Fucking pig. Get a diet before your dad. I stopped. I couldn't concentrate because the whack jobs were still laughing outside. I seriously, seriously don't belong in this crazy family. Bunch of amateurs. Jeremiah Saxton. Body count. 112. Jeremiah, you are a talented child. Your family's going to be jealous and in all of you. Your body count is going to be the stuff of legend. Anyway, while we all admire Jeremiah, let me give you this week's recommendation. This week I'm recommending the book, Public Enemy Zero, by Andrew Maine. The world is out to kill Mitchell Roberts, the helpless girl who needs help changing her tire, his petty ex-girlfriend and her new mate, an entire mall of unassuming shoppers. They all want to murder Mitch in a blind rage when he's in their presence. They'll need to use every resource he has, from the advice of a paranoid late-night radio host to his Twitter account. Pick up this book and find out why he's become Public Enemy Zero. I've owned this book since it first hit Kindle in 2013, and I don't know how many times I've read it. It's an amazing book and takes a different twist on a commonly used scenario. So whether through Kindle or paperback, grab a copy of Public Enemy Zero by Andrew Maine. Now that I've given you this week's recommendation, let's take a trip down to open mic night at Basil Pamba. Welcome, fiends, to open mic night at Beazel Pub, where we invite you to sit right here and go into the more poetic side of fear, poems of murder, creatures, and ghosts, all the things that scare you the most. Tonight, the pub is something different, since this week is Slaughterhouse Originals. Both poems are written by the spooky motherfucker himself, Ghost Train. That's me, by the way, in case you didn't know. The first poem features the return of a character from a previous poem, and this time, he's getting a name. And the second is a follow-up to the poem, To Kill, but told from a different perspective. I hope my rhymes can help you relax and let your guard down. Lean back, close your eyes, and enjoy The Poet and Daddy, Please Stop Killing Me. You're special, Denise, and you don't even know it. Yes, I know your name. You can call me the poet. No, you're not the first, and you won't be the last. But let's not worry about them. The others are in the past. Because tonight it's about you, and what a night it'll be. It's so much better alone, when it's just you and me. I picked you from a dozen, just for this special night. And the moment I come in, I knew the choice was right. The fear in your eyes was so intoxicating. The weight to take you was so excruciating. But patient I must be. Savor every cut, slice, and tear. Allow the ecstasy to fill me, bathing myself in your fear. I'll never forget you. You're burned in my memory. And just to make sure, I'll bring something home with me. All I need from you is a piece to hang on my wall throw the rest of you away. I don't need to have you all. Let me love you. Let me fuck you. Let me kill you tonight. And let me mourn your loss until I fall in love tomorrow night. Know me. Hear me. Fear me. I am the poet, and I will see you soon.
Daddy set the bottle again, and hearing a voice in his head that tells him it's time to play, we should have locked the knives away. Another shot, another line, we're running out of time. I can hear him on the stairs, hiding with my teddy bears. Which room is it tonight? Is he going left or going right? I see the shadow in the hall. I guess it's me, after all. Daddy, please stop killing me. Tonight is going down. Guess you won't see me around. Daddy finally went insane. Stuck that knife into my brain. I'm dead but I can see. What you've done to me. You rotten sloppy drunk. Don't put me in your trunk. Daddy, you went too far. Can't you see me in the car? Dead, I have no doubt. Still next to you, I shout. Daddy, please stop killing me. How can you be so cold? I was only nine years old. I should be sleeping, not dead. Because of the voices in your head. I'm dead because you drink. Weigh me down so I sink. You won't get rid of me so easy. You'll be seeing a lot of me. A ghost visiting every night. A truly chilling sight. Soaking wet with a knife in my head. One day, I'll make you dead. Daddy, please stop killing me. A new character for me to play with in poetic form. I wonder how many times the poet is going to fall in love. And little to me, just because he's dead doesn't mean he's gone. This child ghost will return, and I can't wait to see what he does. But let's leave the pub behind for the night. Please pay the tab, and don't forget to tip. And let's move to tonight's main feature, Slaughterhouse Originals. This month, I've written a story about a man who was once so happy and lucky and loved until it was all ripped away from him. Now he sees something quite a few of us already knew. Hope is a lie. And he is prepared to fight this lie with a smile, just not his own. Double check your locks, doors and windows. Settle back into your couch or bed and enjoy Happy Face. The greatest lie we tell ourselves. I'm going to kill hope. One smile at a time. I had hope once. I really did. I was the guy with the biggest smile. Called myself the luckiest guy in the world. I had my beautiful wife and a child on the way. Now I know how this usually goes. The child dies. They both die. Some unspeakable tragedy. But no, I could handle that. Instead... She just walked at the door with my child still growing inside her, and that was it. A drained bank account, and her harsh words, asking how I could think she'd ever love me if it weren't for my money, and how I'd be paying for the child. Somehow, with no reason, she filed and won a restraining order against me. I had never hit her, had never grabbed her, hell, I barely ever raised my voice to her. I paid for everything, and did everything. I didn't understand. And then, just like that, I saw the truth. Not the fact that I married a gold digger. I saw hope for what it truly is. A lie. Something that makes us think everything is going to be okay. Something that makes us think happiness is real. That we're going to have a loving family and a happily ever after. The greatest lie. That's when I made the decision and began to plan things out. To the rest of Philadelphia, the rest of the world, I was simply Jacob Eastman down in his luck divorce guy that kept showing up at his job and paying his bills on time and that's what I'll always seem like you see I can't simply kill her what good does that do my daughter grows up in the foster care system and finds out one day that her father killed her mother that helps no one however if her mother is just one of many victims of a serial killer then no reason for anyone to seriously look at me no reason I won't get my daughter and raise her to be a better woman than her mother. No credit cards, no cell phone, a hoodie, gloves and a mask, which no one questions anymore. Thank you, Corona. Just completely off the grid as I begin. 
They always tell you in the documentaries that the first victim is usually sloppy and sometimes gives them the best clues because sometimes the first victim is the crime of passion, the one the killer really wanted to kill before it woke his or her bloodlust. So that's what I had to do. Find someone over in Camden, follow them home, sneak my way in before they can react and savagely bring the knife down over and over again, 50, 60, 100 times. Make it look like this is the one I wanted, when really I just thought of her and how she took everything from me. But every serial killer needs a calling card, right? Once the victim is dead, it's time for them to smile for me. I take my knife and carefully cut along the lips, but I make sure to go up at the ends, so that when they find them, they have the biggest, toothiest, lipless smile. What a look it is, for someone who was so brutally murdered to have a great big smile on their face. But it's a fake smile, just like the smile Hope had given me. All around the tri-state area I moved for the next four years. Six in Delaware, 14 in New Jersey, I don't like Jersey. Eight in Philly, similar method, and of course the smile. But also different types of victims. Male, female, skinny, overweight, white, black, Democrat, Republican. The who didn't matter to me. It was just to throw people off. They can't guess at my type because I don't have a type. Now people are just on edge, wondering when Happy Face would strike again. I admit, the name is shit. But unlike Jack the Ripper, I didn't get to name myself. And people aren't as creative as they used to be. Finally, it was time. And Deborah had run out of time. And my daughter was four. And in all those years, all my payments were current. I never started a problem. Lesser reason to look at me. Of course they would at first, but that's why Happy Face always hit twice and hit quickly. Now I was almost inclined to keep her alive for the smile, to watch her suffer as I suffered, to let her know what it feels like to lose your smile. But that would be different, detectable, noticeable. That would get attention on me. So instead I did as I've always done, mask, gloves, hoodie, etc. Sneaking through the door, and before she knew it, I was on her in the kitchen. And I knew it was the best time. 9.45 p.m. Little Angie would have been asleep for 45 minutes. So no worries. With my hand clamped over her mouth. I could see in her eyes that she knew who it was. But still, I kept my mask on. Kept the hood up. No slip-ups. She didn't have to see my face to know. And that was good enough for me. The knife went in. Over and over, 50, 60, 100 times.